Thank you for braving the weather and uh, coming out when a lot of people would just as soon stay in. We're continuing our journey through the book of John. We are on John chapter 1, looking at verses 15 through 28. If you'd uh, open your Bibles to there. In just a minute, I'm going to have Carrie come up and read, but I want to give you some background information that hopefully will make this passage mean a little bit more before we have uh, Carrie come and read it. Um, John was sent by God in order to prepare the hearts of the people um, for the coming Messiah. John is really significant in the New Testament. I was unaware of just how significant he really was because, it, you know, John the Baptist, you always kind of think he's there before Jesus shows up and then he's gone and you just kind of lose track of him. He's mentioned 89 times in the New, New Testament. That's significant. I mean, David doesn't even come close to that many times. So 89 times John the Baptist is Memphis mentioned. Um, he's prophesied in Isaiah chapter 40, the passage that we read earlier. He's also prophesied in Malachi uh, chapter 3 and 4. Basically, people understood that when someone came that was a prophet, and uh, because it had been 400 years since the last prophet, they understood that when the next prophet came, Messiah was right on the horizon. And they were, it was true. That's exactly what was going on. And they were looking for Elijah to come. He was going to be the one that would prepare the way for the people. And in a strange kind of way, uh, John the Baptist was Elijah. He looked like him. He ate like him. He talked like him. He preached like him. Um, so in a lot of ways, he was John the Baptist, but he was not a biological John the Baptist, uh, Elijah. So he, he, he was kind of Elijah, but kind of not Elijah. He had the spirit of Elijah, but didn't have the, the genetics of Elijah. The people misunderstood, and I think a lot of, uh, of people do that today, that there are two comings of Jesus. And the first one was by the spirit of Elijah, and the preparing of the hearts of the people was from John the Baptist, but I really believe there's another, another Elijah coming at the second coming. And he will be a biological Elijah coming and preparing the way for the second coming of Christ. We'll wait and see. On, on all that. Um, Elijah, I'm sorry, John the Baptist was uh, a miraculous birth. If you remember, uh, Zechariah and uh, Elizabeth were very, very old, didn't have uh, any children. And so a lot like Abraham and Sarah, they, their uh, child, John the Baptist, was a miraculous birth. Um, also remember that from Mary's, uh, I'm sorry, Mary, from Elizabeth's womb, John the Baptist had the Holy Spirit. And, and leap for joy when he when, uh, met Jesus. Um, John the Baptist is called by Jesus the most important person to ever walk on the planet up to that time. John the Baptist is someone we need to listen to, and I think we need to listen to him more than anything for the message that he brings that we need to prepare our hearts for the coming Messiah. It had been 400 years since a prophet had come, and people flocked to John the Baptist. He was out in the middle of nowhere. Um, if you go to, to, the, uh, to Holy Land and you go to the place where John the Baptist more than likely preached, which was close to Jericho, it would be about 18 miles to Jerusalem up 3,000 feet elevation from where John the Baptist. So when you spent the day listening to John the Baptist, you had a long haul to go back to, to Jerusalem to where you were living. Either that or stay out in the desert for the night and then make the journey the next day, but that's no fun. Because it's the middle of nowhere. There's no holiday inns. Like there's no holiday inns in the middle of the desert in the United States. So if you travel across the Mojave Desert, make sure you have lots of gas. Because you're on your own. That's where John the Baptist preached. It is recorded that maybe as, million, as many as a million people went out to hear John the Baptist preach in the middle of nowhere. A million when the text says that everybody from Judea came to hear him, everybody from Judea came to hear him. He was very, very significant. In verse 15, John has this really, really interesting phrase. He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Absolutely spot on, which I'm sure the people at that time went, you're a prophet? You can't speak any clearer than that. Nothing could be clearer if you know the truth. 
he who comes after me, I was born earlier, John the Baptist said. Jesus was born six months later. He that comes after me has surpassed me. He's much greater than me. Than me. In fact, I'm not even worthy to put his shoes on because he was before me, because Jesus actually existed before the creation of the world. So even though he was born after me, he was way ahead of me. So in that loaded phrase is all sorts of information that um, John the Apostle wants you to know that John the Baptist said about Jesus. When John is being questioned by people saying, who are you? Are you Elijah? He says, I'm not, because he knows he's not biological Elijah, and he knows that there's another Elijah coming. They say, are you the prophet? What does that mean? The prophet was the prophet predicted by Moses way back in Deuteronomy chapter 18. It was the one that Moses said, when this prophet comes, he'll be far greater than me. Listen to him. We know from Stephen's confession in Acts chapter 6 and 7, and we know from Peter's confession in his writings, that the prophet is Jesus. So there are only one person off. John the Baptist pre, uh, prepared the way for Jesus, and they're saying, are you the prophet? Nobody's coming. In fact, he's on the doorstep. Finally, the last thing you need to understand is that John the Baptist is called John the Baptist because he baptized people. This was scandalous. In the first century, Jews were never baptized. The only time a Jewish person would be baptized is if he was high priest in the temple, serving in the temple, and he would be baptized before he went into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. A Jewish person was never baptized. They were a child of Abraham. We were in. John the Baptist comes along and says, no, y'all all need to be baptized. Because at that time, the only people that were baptized were Gentiles who understood that the God of the universe was really the true God, and they were saying by being baptized, we're saying no to our old Gentile ways, and we want to be entered into the Jewish faith, into worshiping Yahweh, the God of the Bible. We want to worship him, and we're saying no to our old ways. We'll be baptized, and now we'll be Jews by adoption. So for a Jewish person to be baptized was basically to confess, I've been a Gentile. And John the Baptist says, y'all need to be baptized. Because just because you're a biological child of Abraham does not mean, mean you're a child of Abraham by faith. In fact, you're not. Your hearts are far from God. And you need to prepare your hearts in order to receive the God of the universe because he's on the doorstep, he's coming. And if your heart isn't prepared, you'll never see him. Listen very, very carefully as Carrie Snyder comes and reads from John chapter 1, verses 15 through 28. Good morning. Good morning. Could we please all stand if we're able for the word? John 1, 15 through 28. John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the, ful ful ah, so sorry. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. After, are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, 
but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptized. You may be seated. Be seated. Thanks. I'd encourage you to pull out your sermon outlines and follow along. There's a lot of uh, important quotes that I want you to, to uh, be able to track with. And if you're like me, on a winter's day like this, and been outside, and you're in nice and warm, and you're sitting and doing nothing for 35, 40 minutes. I'm going to do all I can to make sure that that doesn't happen, because this is a really, really important text. Question to be answered is this, and why does John include the testimony of John the Baptist? And please understand, we're talking about two different Johns. Point number five, we're going to be talking about three different Johns. It put the, there's John the Baptist that John the Apostle is writing about. So, why does John the Apostle include the testimony of John the Baptist? I believe the answer is this. So we might repent and prepare our hearts and believe Jesus is the Christ, the light of the world and the light of life, and thus have hope. That's why John the Apostle is writing the book of John. If you look at uh, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he says, These things have been written so you might have faith in the one and only Son of God, and by having faith in him, you might have life in his name. That's why this whole book is written, and I'm really, really excited that this book will give us 2020 vision in 2020 to help us to understand better who Christ is and that we might have a better life. Pastor Dave inspired me in several different ways last week with his message. Not only to use illustrations to better uh, make a point, which I'm going to try to use one a little bit, but also to use light bulb jokes. <laughs> Talking about Jesus being the light of the world. So, how many angle class Catholics does it take to change a light bulb? You silly people, they use candles. <laughs> how many free Methodists does it take to change a light bulb? 25, one to change the light bulb and 24 to have the fellowship dinner afterwards. <laughs> How many Amish does it take to change the light bulb? <clears throat> change? <laughs> How many Calvinists? Now, you got to know your theology to know this one. How many Calvinists does it t take to change the light bulb? Only God can change the light bulb. <laughs> This is my favorite. How many real women does it take to change a light bulb? None. Because real women will have real men by their side, and they'll change the light bulb. <laughs> Wait till two weeks from today when I have more light bulb jokes. I have one that's going to get me in big trouble. Word for the day is prepare. Hopefully you're prepared to hear what God has for us to hear today from John chapter 1, verses 15 through 28. First point, what testimony does John the Baptist give regarding Jesus? Jesus is God and man. Pastor Dave made a good point of this last week. Please understand that the book of John, more than any other book, is going to beat this into our brains. It is absolutely crucial that you understand that Jesus is both God and man. You are not saved if he's not God and man. Your salvation is hollow if he isn't God and man. And there are some serious implications that some of us have with, God, with Jesus being a man. In fact, we're deeply offended when we start thinking about Jesus being a man like you and I. That'll be point five. John testifies concerning Jesus, and he cries out saying, this is verse 15 from our text today, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because it was before me. That only makes sense if you understand that John the Baptist is talking about Jesus being God, and even though he was born man after John the Baptist, he existed from when time began, and John the Apostle talks about that in the message that Pastor Dave gave last week. I'll let you look online if you didn't, weren't here or don't remember. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. This is, this is just absolutely wonderful, logical thinking, and it's something that a lot of people in 21st century American church have a problem with. That's why his 
quote here is so uh, absolutely amazing. It comes from Mere Christianity. In my book at home, it's on page 55. I'm not sure what page it is on your book because there's like 50,000 different editions of Mere Christianity. But this is what uh, C.S. Lewis says. Please follow along. It's talking about people who say Jesus is a great teacher, but I can't accept that he's God. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else you'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either Jesus was and is the son of God, or else he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. I get it at least once a year. People sitting underneath my teaching and Pastor Dave's teaching, I just can't accept that Jesus was God. John is going to beat that into our heads. He's going to show us in a lot of different ways that Jesus is God because it's crucial that we understand that Jesus was God, is God, and took upon himself humanity in order to be our substitute. That's the testimony that John the Baptist gives. It's also the testimony that John the Apostle gives, point number two. What testimony did John the Baptist give regarding Jesus? Jesus gives grace upon grace. We talked about the grace of Jesus a little bit earlier in in the Pastor Dave's message last week, but it's really clear here in verse 16. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. The Greek actually says we've received grace upon grace. And if you look at what the New Testament has to say about those believers in Christ, it's true. We've been given the hope of eternal life. We are hopeless without Christ coming. We've been able to have courage to face whatever we have to face in this life. We are co-heirs with Christ. In other words, everything Jesus owns, we own. We've been more than conquerors through Christ. In fact, if God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. No eye has seen, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.9. No ear has heard. No mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. By the way, those of you going through the book of Ephesians are in great position in order to understand point number two because the, the, um, the apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians shows us over and over and over grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And in chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians, verses 18 through 20, the apostle Paul says this, I pray that your eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. And and what are we doing? It's like owning a Ferrari and hooking it up as a dog sled. That's where we're at. We're putting around town, buying a bunch, all we're seeing is a butts of dogs, and we're sitting in our Ferrari. But we don't use the key to start it up. I sat behind the wheel of a really nice sports car once in my life. The chills are going up and down my spine right now. If you want to buy me a Christmas present, (laughs) buy me one hour with a Corvette. 
someplace where there's no speed limit. <laughs> Folks, we have all of these resources available to us. We're living like we're looking at the butts of dogs. <sighs> Ephesians, again, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, more than we can imagine, Grace upon grace. And here's something you need to understand from the book of James, chapter 4, verse 7. Grace always flows downhill. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you exalt yourself, you're put, you've put yourself in a position where grace cannot flow to you. If you build yourself up and make yourself something you're not, grace can't flow to you. Grace always flows to the humble. Always flows downhill. Number three, what testimony does John the Baptist give regarding Jesus? Jesus reveals God. Verse 18 of today's text. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Folks, when we look to Jesus, we're seeing God. So if you want to know how God treats sinners, look to Jesus. If you want to know how God feels about sin, look to Jesus. How much did Jesus hate sin? He was willing to die in order to eradicate it from our lives. If you want to know what kind of compassion God has, look to Jesus. If you want to know what other things he has, I'm going to do this. I've made my mind up. I was going to abort this because it absolutely failed in the first service, but I might as well go ahead because I just talked about humility anyway. If you are epileptic, or, well, probably won't work now. Um, if you have epileptic tendencies, um, please shut your eyes when I do this. This is a strobe light, and it may cause you to have an epileptic, t- you know, one of those things. If, um, what? Well, it's actually true. It can. So, so what I'm going to do is try to show you how a special light can reveal what we can't see otherwise. So here we go, strobe light. If it still works. Yeah, it does. Can you read that that way? No. Hopefully you can read it this way. Can you read it? So if we want to know what God is like in regard to love, we look to Jesus. He is the light that will show us. And if you're epileptic, you can now... Safely open your eyes. He's the one that shows us what real love is. In fact, it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God's demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus reveals to us what God is like. He gives us 20-20 vision so that we can see the reality of who God is and who we are. And how desperately we need a, a savior. Number four, what testimony has John the Baptist given us regarding Jesus? John is a voice preparing the way for Jesus. And what's that voice saying? Repent. A broken and contrite heart is what the God of the universe is looking for because that's a heart that is receptive to his word. That is a heart that hasn't built up the obstacles of its own pride and arrogance, which is an obstacle to the king coming to you. 
You do understand that from Isaiah chapter 40 and also what John the Baptist is saying, they're making a reference to when king went to obscure little places in his kingdom. And when the king went to obscure little places in his kingdom, the paths were often very not fit for a king to travel on. There were passages that were very narrow that you had. In fact, it's still in, in, uh, in Palestine today. There's paths that's only this wide and cliffs on each side. That's not suitable for a king. The roads are like this, and they're all over the place, and there's no, no uh, good way to get there. And so if you wanted to make sure you had the favor of the king once he got to your town, you would go out of your way to make the path level. Turn the, 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 the ravines and the mountains into a plain, as Isaiah says in 40, chapter 40. You would prepare the way for the king to come to your particular town and village so that when he got there, he would bless you profusely, not go, what is this? This has been an absolute torture coming here. That makes sense? We need to do that with our hearts, John the Baptist says. What's the biggest rut we have? What's the biggest obstacle we have? Pride. Arrogance. We build up obstacles for the king to enter our hearts so that he can bless us because of our pride. My wife and I, uh, every once in a while, will have people under our homes who have special allergies, either with, with material things or with food. And Jean goes out of her way to prepare our house so that when those guests, especially our grandson uh, Conley, he has all sorts of allergies. And so my wife goes to great lengths. So when my grandson comes, he has a pleasant time. So he wants to come back to grandma and grandpa's house. He doesn't come and be tortured the entire time. We prepare our house so that the one that's coming to our house will feel welcomed and feel... Folks, we need to do that with our hearts with Jesus. And the last I knew, roads don't say, stay the same way once they've been made flat. You do live in Michigan. <laughs> you ignore a road for five years and you may not be able to pass on it any longer. Because roads deteriorate, so do our hearts. We need to maintain our hearts and prepare them so that the king will be welcomed into our hearts when he comes. Finally, number five, which is not the end of the sermon, just the end of the points. So don't get your hopes up. Besides, I have 20 more minutes and I'm going to use every one of them. What testimony does John the Baptist give us regarding Jesus? The greatest person in the world is not worthy to clean Jesus' toilet. This is John the Apostle talking about the message of John the Baptist cleaning Jesus' John. Now, it's really interesting, and I, I, I did not foresee this, but in the first service it hit me like a ton of bricks, and so now I'm watching. Some of you are deeply offended that I would talk about cleaning Jesus' toilet. You have not paid attention and fully absorbed point number one. You have failed to fully comprehend that Jesus is God and man. I remember in my life, up until about age 30, 35, I was deeply offended when anybody would talk about Jesus having to wipe his brow or, or with Jesus bleeding or Jesus having to eat like us or Jesus having to go in the bathroom like us, I was deeply offended by that. Folks, it's what makes him great. He was willing as the God of the universe who had no body. He was pure spirit. He didn't have to mess with any of this kind of stuff. Pure joy, pure peace, pure love. And yet he put on himself all of these restraining restrictions because of love. And John the Baptist says, 
I'm not worthy of latching his thong. Do you understand that, that in that particular time, there was actually a rabbinical statement. It's in your sermon outline. There's a rabbinical statement that says, every service which a slave performs for his master shall a disciple do for his teacher except the loosing of a sandal thong. You're to do everything for your master that you're for your, your rabbi but you don't have to loose a song. That's just below you. John the Baptist says, there's nothing below me because I'm not even worthy to undo his thong. He is so much greater than I am that even the most humiliating thing, I'm not worthy to do that for him. Do we see Jesus that way? I rub shoulders with a lot of pastors. And I can tell you something that turns me off immediately with pastors is when they tell me, well, I'm too good for that. That's below me to do that job. Jesus was, Jesus, the Son of God, was willing to not only wash feet, which is a lot lower than unloosing a thong of a sandal, but was willing to die. There's nothing below us if Jesus asks us to do it. Nothing. I hate cats. I... The, the commercial on TV, is, what, what is that? Is it progressive? Is there an insurance company of some sort that, that's on TV that's got a guy acting like a cat? And he sets up on the counter and he starts the faucet and it overflows and it destroys the, the first floor of the house. Then he goes in the counter and just knocks things off and shatters them. That's cats. My dog adores me. In fact, I open the door and she goes, you're God, what can I do to serve you, master? (laughs) In fact, there was a dog and a cat before the throne of God. And the dog and the cat were were ushered in before the throne of God and the dog got down and prostrated itself and said, oh, master of the universe, I'm at your service. What would you have me do? The cat looked up and said, God, you're on my throne, get off. And if you don't think that's true, you're not watching Cats. <laughs> not the movie or the Broadway show either. Who are we? Are we dogs or cats? There should be nothing below us of what Jesus can ask us to do if we truly understand who Jesus is. My worship point is this. Worship Christ whose glory and majesty far exceeds anything we can dream or imagine. Worship Christ because he used his glory to save us and not promote himself. There's this quote by George uh, Buttrick. I'm going to read it real quickly, but I would encourage you to go back later and really mull it over. It's in your sermon outline. It is indeed an extraordinary conception of the Godhead to which it brought us. Our eyes are not a- are apt to be dazzled by the attributes, omniscience, and omnipresence and such august and unthinkable qualities to be caught and held by pomps and thrones and splendors and metaphors which lead us far astray. For the essence of Godhead, what makes God God is none of these but a humility that stoops far lower than any man would stoop and a patient kindness that bears on and on long after every human heart would have been fretted into a passion of anger and an unselfishness so huge that it sweeps away in whirling flood our biggest human measures as hopelessly inadequate and bursts on our human minds. 
Our earthly conventions and ways, our grabbiness and pushfulness and self-indulgence are local and parochial as a county accent. That heaven in which God's will is done is, to our eyes, a topsy-turvy place where the least is the greatest and the greatest is the least and the king is servant of all. I really appreciated uh, Caleb and Alethe is special. Who am I? A vapor in the wind. Five years from my retirement, this church will barely even recognize my name. The Lord brings his servants in and replaces the servants that were there just like a drop of water is taken out of a five-gallon bucket. It's never missed. And turning things over to Pastor Dave has been hard. But I keep reminding myself, 10 years from now, it won't even matter. Though I've long forgot about me. All that matters is that you know Jesus. Gospel application. Acknowledge that this glorious, majestic Christ loves you so much that he lived and died so you could have eternal life and experience grace upon grace, upon grace, upon grace, upon grace. We are clueless about how much grace God wants to bestow upon us. We're absolutely clueless. Spiritual challenge. The means of grace will put you in a position to receive grace upon grace. Make sure you hear true testimony from credible witnesses before you form an opinion about anything, but especially you form an opinion about Jesus. Otherwise, false testimony will steal your hope and your joy. And that's why the book of John is written, that you might know the truth and that truth would set you free. It's in John 8, verses 31 through 36. And also that... Th John's testimony about what he saw and heard will be communicated to you so that you might know Jesus and have faith in his name and by having faith in his name, have a life. It's the 2020 vision I hope we all are able to get in 2020 by looking at God, uh, John's gospel. So what? Our lack of love and affection for Jesus, our inability to obey and follow Jesus, and our lack of hope and joy in our lives comes from wrong thinking as a result of false testimony about Jesus. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Listen to lies, and you'll be enslaved. I want you to read, follow along in that first quote after the so what point. It says this, and it, by the way, it's given credit to Steve Brown. I know that's not true. I know he, I'm pretty sure he stole it for Stanley Hallerwas, but this is what my resources said, so, and I'm not sure if it was Stanley Hallerwas, so I'm going to use Steve Brown. It's not for me, but I wish it was. Pagans can come in contact with the dead organism of Christianity and thereafter be immune to the real thing. Do you know how an inoculation works? They take a, a dead sample of some organism and they inject it in your veins and it builds up your immune system so you can fight that organism, whatever it is. What the writer Steve Brown and Stanley Harawas and whoever said it is saying, we are at real risk in 21st century America because there are a lot of people who are dead Christians, if they're Christians at all. And by being exposed to them, we can be inoculated to the real thing when we come in contact with the real Jesus. Do not look at Pastor Keith to find out what the real Jesus is like. That's like coming in contact with a dead organism of Christianity, although I hope I'm not that dead. <laughs> look to Jesus. 
He is the author and perfecter of your faith, not Pastor Keith. That's one of the things I keep telling myself over and over again as I'm getting ready to turn things over to Pastor Dave to retire. It didn't matter what I did anyway. All that mattered is that people see Jesus. There's a sermon by uh, Tim Keller called The Deity of Jesus in which he makes an absolutely astounding point. We know that someone has to be greater to enter into the lesser because the lesser can never enter into the greater. And so a, a proof of someone's greatness is their willingness to become less. It's kind of like someone that's got their PhD teaching mentally handicapped children because sometimes that's the only people that can get through to them because it takes an exceptional person to be able to teach someone who's handicapped. I I still maintain that the best teachers I've ever sat under were all children's ministers because in order to really be great, a great teacher... Try teaching the Ten Commandments to three-year-olds. You got to be really good to do that, to lower yourself and enter into their world to be able to teach that. Listen, my dog and I wrestle around a lot. She, she lets on like she likes it. She may just be submitting to me because she thinks I'm God, but <laughs> I, it's, I have hardwood floors, and it's absolutely a delight to me to take her and shove her like this on the hardware floors. <laughs> and she's going like that and spinning around like this. And then she hops up and spins out and comes right back for it. And then I do it again. And she would do it like. And it's easy for me to lower myself to a dog and play with my dog. But can I tell you something, quite honestly? My dog has never come to me and talked about theology. She's incapable. The lesser can never rise to the greater. But the greater, a signal and a sign of their greatness is that they can lower themselves and enter into the world of the lowly. What has Jesus done for us? In fact, it's a sign of his greatness. And the Apostle Paul picks up on this in Philippians chapter 2. That Jesus was willing to become a servant, even to the very death on a cross. Therefore, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God that Jesus is Lord. Why? Because his willingness to go down low showed how great he really was. Folks, what are we doing creating obstacles for the God of the universe when he's clearly shown us that the way for grace upon grace to be given us is not to raise ourselves up, but to lower ourselves down. He proved it was true through his very son. There was one time a little girl whose dad was uh, sick, and she was only about three or four years old, and she was trying to entertain her dad during Christmas time because her dad was with a flu, not like here in Hillsdale the last three weeks. Okay, I thought more of you would realize what I was referring to than that. Because we've had a lot of sickness here in Hillsdale lately. But this little girl wanted to entertain her dad, so she was through origami, right? Origami, folding paper, making a nativity scene for her dad while her dad was laying on the couch. She had the crash and the cows and the... Mary and Joseph and the wise men and everything else. It took her hours to put this together. And finally says, Daddy, do you like my little nativity scene? Oh, honey, that's nice. Do you see baby Jesus? And the guy said, no, honey, I, I don't see baby Jesus. I see everything else. I, I think. And she said, oh, well, Daddy, you can't see it where you are. You have to get on your knees and get lower. Then you can see baby Jesus. Many of you are not seeing Jesus because you haven't gone low enough. God is opposed to the proud, 
but gives grace upon grace upon grace upon grace to the humble. As my seminary professor would tell us often, go low. Go low. 